it's got to be Tony Elias with his first win of 2019. As he comes onto the front straightaway, Josh Heron will take the checkered flag and victory here at race number two. So these two riders, Yoshimura Suzuki teammates now and friends, Tony Elias and Josh Heron, they make up for three of the four victories we have had so far in this EBC Brakes Superbike class in Moto America. But the question is, have these two been this tight the whole time? Well, we put together something that kind of showcases the evolution of Josh Heron and Tony Elias and their relationship. I was battling with Josh and I break super late, the, the most late I, I, I couldn't in that moment. But he wanted to pass me, he break even more late. And at the end, we found each other. If I remember correctly, correctly he, he rolled off the brakes a little bit when he saw me there and kind of dived to the inside like, like he does sometimes. And uh, we just ended up hitting each other. And no matter the reason, you know, I, I got up just feeling bad that both of us crashed. So I was just like trying to calm him down because I didn't want him coming over and karate chopping me. But Still, sometimes we are talking about that and he's telling me, yeah, that was my fault, but also you had uh, your part of fault. Said, man, no, <laughs> I break late, but you didn't break. You just go in and you and you knock me out, no? And <laughs> it was uh, pretty heated. I came over in the pits afterwards and said sorry, and he just was like yelling at me and like, all right, dude, see it. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, uh, that moment I was I was very angry. Like last year, I could be super angry with with Cameron in in Road America, but this is racing. Some days you are the part. Who you are who provocate that, and, the, and another day you are the one who is uh, laying on the grass. Yeah, now it's just something we look look back on and laugh. He'd probably just call me a stupid gringo, but <laughs> nah, hope it doesn't happen again. But yeah, it's racing. We understand uh, the good thing. The time helps to forget all these things, but always is a li little bit there. But we have a good relationship. I'm pumped. I'm, I hope that. Hopefully we can keep the chemistry going and, and remain friends because it uh, definitely helps, I think, both of us. And we communicate well together and, and have a lot of fun. And uh... Turn 12 again, two years later. <laughs> Maybe in the same situation, uh, but I just hope with a, with a better ending, no? Not on the grass, both on the tarmac, fighting for 1-2, and that's what we want. All right, so that's where we are now with those two Yosh teammates, Jason. But you've had a lot of teammates over the years. Any mix-ups or rough-ups with those guys? Uh, I've had a few maybe, but I've pretty much got along with all my teammates. Look, these guys are two years removed from that. Heron just had his first big win last, last time we were out. So VIR offers a lot of that kind of closeness when it comes to the racing here, and it, it can happen pretty easily. Mm -hmm. A lot was said about that incident, but I think it's behind them now, and hopefully they'll move forward and, and keep battling each other clean. And Josh Heron told me that he's much more matured than he was two years ago. We'll take a commercial break. On the other side, racers will be on track as we inch closer to the start of the CBC Brake Superbike class. All right, welcome back to the 2019 Moto America Superbike Series. It's the EBC Brake Superbike class, Jason, and uh, and we talked about a broken clouds here today. Obviously, Hannah told us it's getting pretty hot, but what was hot was <laughs> the EBC Brake Superbike Super Pole qualifying. These highlights, Jason, well, I'm going to tell you something. It was not an expected Super Pole by any stretch of the imagination. Craziest 15 minutes I've seen in a long time. This is Tony. He rolled out of the pits and went into turn two. Or turn one, and the next thing you know, we saw this on our screen. The bike had died five corners or six corners into his session. Then he came back out thinking that, okay, now this is with three and a half minutes to go. He just needs to go out there and get one lap, and again, the bike made it two corners, and that was the end of it. Then, we had Cameron Bobier, who was already quickest, puts his cue on, and on his first flying lap, you can see, he loses the front going into turn five. A uh, lot of grip coming from that left to that right, tucks the front. Uh, and, and ends up falling over. This guy, Matthew Skultz, had done some testing here preseason. This Yamaha uh, uh, Westby team has done a great job this year getting him comfortable on a fairly new motorcycle. He ends up third. Cameron Bobier from his previous time on a race tire, Greg, yeah. does his 23.9, I believe is what it was, or 24.1 on a, on a race tire. Didn't even get to put a cue on. 
He ends up second still. And how about this guy, Garrett Gerlop again. Puts it on pole just like he did in Atlanta two races ago. Really love to see this guy be able to do something with that starting spot today and have a little luck on his side. All right, so here's a look at the front row of the grid. Garrett Gerloff, the only rider in the 23-9 range in Super Pole. Cameron Bobier, like Jason said, on a race tire before that Q crash, a 124.155. And Matthew Skulls just behind at a 124.181. Well, that's going to be the closest look at turn number one will be the 31. In ninth spot on the grid is going to be Tony Elias because of the problems he had. Man, he expended a lot of energy trying to push his motorcycle around this 2.25-mile road course. Jason, it's a beauty. Yeah. Our track map sponsored by Dunlop, and you can see, Greg, they start there right where it says T14 is where they start. Turn one's our main passing area off a big, long straightaway. Turn two, three, kind of a very strange complex of corners. Very, very tricky into the four, five. We get a lot of fans over there, four, five, um, through the S's, down to turn seven under the bridge. Then you kind of go across, up, a big up a big hill, across a ridge into turn 10, and then from there, it's all back downhill. Very flowing racetrack. If you just get a couple little sections wrong, it has a tendency to make the rest of that sector a little bit harder. Let's have a look, Craig, at the Suzuki hot spots. And uh, when these I, are these are spots you picked, right? Yeah, these are spots I picked. And when you look at it, turn one, you can see we have a lot of runoff at VIR, which I love, and we've seen a lot of riders have to use that because it's so easy to get in this corner a little bit too fast. As you come out of there, you head down into that turn two, three, four area, and then I looked at four A to five A. There's a left followed by the right. That right that you see there initially is the one that Cameron actually tipped off in. And you kind of roll the throttle on, you get back out of it a little bit, and then you go down through these S's towards that Nissan bridge that you see down there, uh, down the track a little ways. And this is where you come under that bridge into turn seven. This is where you go back uphill. You can see some of the other racetrack. That would be our south course that, we've not, that we don't use here in Moto America. You go across this ridge, Greg. This is all kind of up and down and very flowing into turn 10. And the reason I put 10 through 13 is because turn 10 is where we saw our incident when Tony and uh, Josh Heron were talking about their incident there. That was turn 10. From that point, you go down a big steep hill. Turn 13 leads you onto the straightaway and uh, very, very steep downhill section. You get a lot of fans on the right-hand side as well. Love this track. A lot of fun, Greg. Really fun place. Virginia International Raceway showcasing this part of the United States. And this time of year, absolutely spectacular. A good look at the roller coaster that leads you onto that front straight. We're gonna take a break. On the other side, bikes on the warm-up lap, so we're gonna get this thing rolling. Stay tuned. Today's coverage is brought to you by EBC Brakes, the official sponsor of the 2019 Moto America Superbike Series. All right, welcome back to VIR. As bikes are on their warm-up lap, let's take a look at what we have on the grid here. So row number one, we showed you it's Gerloff, Bobier, and Skull, J.D. Beach, Jake Lewis, and Josh Heron. On row number two after Super Bowl qualifying, Peterson Wyman and Tony Elias couldn't get his bike going. Then we have David Anthony, Jake Gagne, and Max Flinders on row number four. On back through the field as the riders are starting to form up that grid just outside of our commentary position, Jason. We're looking to see one of the things we didn't seem like I we saw. I think I saw him. Yeah. I think I okay. did see Tony. Yeah. I, he he kind of likes to go off into turn one and then stop and then yeah. roll through. But in some of our – there he is. And uh, But in some of our early shots there that we saw, I was looking for him, and he wasn't quite going through. But Talking yeah, about Tony, Tony Elias taking the grid. So he'll be starting from ninth place. We've seen him do this before. Do not be shocked. Exactly if you spot, see, huh? yeah, if you see, Yeah, if you see Tony Elias coming from ninth place – and get the whole shot. So it's time for the EBC Brakes. Superbike class, race number one from VIR. You're going to see upper left-hand part of your screen. Those red lights are going to go on. And when they go off, it's time to let out the clutches. Revs are up. Here we go. Gerloff got a good Great launch. Start. Didn't look like Cam Bobier got one. Tony Elias did, though. He's seeing him on the very far inside. He is down there. You see him right behind Josh Heron, but he is going to fall into about six, it looks like. Maybe seven. If J.D. Beach can close it off because he's sneaking up the inside. Uh, he's trying to, isn't he? 
So look who's leading the way, the South African, Matthew Schultz, number 11 on the West V Racing Yamaha, leads the way over Factory Rider. Uh, Garrett Gerloff, who was our pole sitter. One of the things I think that everybody's got to be a little bit concerned with is knowing that Cameron did his lap time this morning on a race tire and still stayed second on the grid. Now, I know Tony didn't get to do a lap and so on and so forth, but he still stayed second on the grid. And uh, But Matthew Skultz doing a really good job here at the beginning of this race. Guy that we expect to see not only leading but winning races as well. Was here April 1st on an extremely cold day at VIR. So the team go and Skultz, he goes a little sideways working with that new Magneti Morelli Electronics. They were here just to do some overall tuning of that motorcycle as they continue to develop these electronics. But it is the first year for this team with these electronics. And every time they go out, they're learning something. So it's a trio of Yamahas up front. Then the Suzuki of Josh Heron, there's Tony Elias from ninth spot. He's up into sixth already. So Westby Racing's Matthew Skultz, he's going to lose a spot as Gerloff tries him around oh, the outside. Cameras down sideways. deep on the inside of both of them. Oh, wow. Three wide they go. The order doesn't change. That was a lot of energy expended for no difference. But it's those two Monster Energy Yamalub Yamaha factory racing riders that are going for it early. J.D. Beach slides his way up into fourth, so he got by Josh Heron. He was deep in the draft coming down this front straightaway. Must have outbroken down into turn one. We were watching these three guys, Greg, go three wide, and J.D. Beach has quietly now made it. A Yamaha foursome up at the front, and a trio of Suzuki's Heron, Elias, and Jake Lewis all in that order following right behind. And you can see Cameron wanting to have another look. Now, you said something really interesting to me yesterday. You said that we have two different ways we see these races sometimes here at VIR. We have it where a guy can just take off and vanish at the front. And I said, I don't think it can happen this year, but the way Cameron looks right now, it looks like he wants to get through and try to make a little bit of a disappearing act. He's trying, Greg. Oh, oh Matthew, Matthew Skultz loses the front in turn 10. Oh, no. So Skultz, he had a gap. Just a little bit of a gap and tosses it down the road, leaving it to two factory Yamahas and a privateer, J.D. Beach, in a good spot right now. Of course, Beach, the number 95 on, oh man, J.D. Oh. Beach on that attack performance, Essison Racing Yamaha as we go back as Skulti tries to get that bike up. But Heron Beach dive bomb and J.D. Beach for third. He does. Yep, gets but, through. But Beach coming off of his first. AFT race win in the Twins class. A lot of confidence for him. He'll lose his spot. He's going to settle for fourth for the moment. And Josh was quite off in the first se session this morning, and him and his team, you alluded to them making some pretty big gearing changes and things like that. They made some definite improvements in qualifying practice uh, number two. And then in Super Bowl, I wouldn't say that Heron set the world on fire, but this is what experience does. You come off your first win, you start sixth, you kind of methodically work your way back behind JD there. Now Josh Heron has got himself back up into that third spot and it looks like that whatever he was trying to get used to with that bike, as you see Matthew Skultz really frustrated, I'm sure. He was just starting to get a little bit of a gap, but it's so easy to do this in turn 10. You really, by the time you get to the apex of 10, you want to try to have not been trail braking too deep into there, and it looks like he was just maybe still on the brakes mm -hmm. ever so slightly. And when the road goes away from you like it does up there, it's very easy to do that. And when you trail brake, brake like that, at that extreme lean angle, you do take the risk of locking up that front tire and low siding. If you're new to motorcycle road racing, that is a classic low side crash. Back up front we go, Garrett Gerloff leads the way from Cameron Bobier. Gerloff the 31, Bobier the number one, indicating he is the reigning national champion. Cameron's close enough this time to do it, take a shot, and that's exactly what he's done. He is in deep, Greg. Let's see if he can get that bike stopped and turned, and he's able to. Now, you're gonna see Cameron, he's gonna do his best to just try to throw down one or two unbelievable sectors. I'm really impressed with Josh Heron right now. He has gone up to these two Yamaha guys and gone with them. 24-7 for Josh Heron on the last lap. Tony Elias has now worked himself into fifth, past, or into fourth rather, past J.D. Beach. That must have happened down in turn one, as you can see on our screen there. J.D. locked in still there in fifth, and you can see Jake Lewis just off the back of those guys in sixth place. So Cam Bobier gets the lead that he wanted. We talked about him in his qualifying effort. He was P2 on the grid, and he did that on a race tire. Never got to get on that queue and even do a full lap. So Jason and I had been talking about the question mark of Bobier. Can he continue to pull the trigger on these Dunlop tires? 
We can see the combination that, that he has in terms of tire selection as they are stickered up for the, the soft compound tires. And this ex, extra soft is what uh, Cameron Bobier loves in terms of that front tire. But Jason, I thought for a moment, if Cameron took the lead, that it would start to stretch the field it's out. Not. Instead, it's really starting to pack up. Oh, you're 100% right, Craig. I kind of expected the same thing. Let's see what this fl first flying lap for Cameron by as he leads his first lap. Garrett Gerloff is now in his draft. You're going to see these guys go down into turn one here. And uh, Cameron's deep into there and looks like Heron uh, not quite close enough, and neither is Tony. 25-1, 24-6, though, for Tony Elias back there in fourth place. So the pace is a little quicker behind the leaders right now as Heron moved himself up with a 24-7 the lap prior at 24-6 for Tony Elias this time through. J.D. Beach is there. Jake Lewis, 25-4. So he's doing his best to try to get on the back on the back of these guys. Anything that these lead three, four, five riders do, and Jake Lewis is going to be right there in the mix with them. All right, so Bobier, as you can see from, watch when the tires go through. Watch those kind of mint stickers. So extra soft front, extra soft rear for Bobier and Garrett Gerloff. 30. Soft, soft front. For, uh, for it looks like uh, Josh Heron. Yep. We're extra soft both sides for Tony. So just a little slight, a slight change or difference, I should say, in tire selection for the number two rider in your, or number three rider in the screen wearing the number two, yeah. Josh Heron. Look at that first split, 39-4, purple on our screen. And that's why you're just seeing a tiny, tiniest bit of separation. Garrett Gerloff has just got to keep his face looking forward at his teammate because he's starting to just gap that both the Yamaha guys are just starting to gap ever so slightly the Yosh bikes there. That was Daisuke Hashimoto, who's the crew chief for the number 24, Tony Elias, who's now going to make a move on his teammate and does what Tony does best, goes straight for the apex, sending his GSXR sideways. Heron goes underneath them with a little flick of the wave. Yep, just to kind of say, you know, at that point, Josh doesn't have a choice. He's got to go back underneath him. The opportunity is there. And uh, I feel like, like Tony's probably looking, and he goes right to the apex again, Greg. Goes there goes the Scud four. missile. He's yep. going to go in turn four. He's got to take over. He's got position. But can Heron square it off? And oh, yeah. See, I, I, all that stuff to me, all that gesturing, I don't like it. It's just get on with it. It's racing. That's what you're doing. You're racing. And if Tony's got some base, he can help pull you back up along. And and that's that's that to me is like, this, just get on with it. Yeah, but this speaks to the Josh Heron, the old, the new, and the new again. And that is, Josh told me, look, last time we were on the racetrack, I followed Tony, followed Tony. That's what I did when I was a 600 rider. Then everybody criticized me and said, oh, Josh Heron, you don't know how to lead a race. So we decided to learn how to lead a race. And then he would throw shots at people and slow people down. And now he said, look, I was comfortable following and then making a pass. So Stop he said, this is about what people think. Well, you know, they, yeah, that, that's well, the thing is but, it's but win, the, win at any cause and how you can. And you can, you know, for me, it looks like Tony's got a little bit of pace right now. And so the fact that he wants to get by, he went by in turn one. Josh did the right thing. He went back up underneath him. Tony took a shot in turn four. Just get on with it. You know, like there's no sense of gesturing. All right, so Cameron Bobier continues to lead the way. Garrett Gerloff, though, last time by, set his personal best of the race, which is a 24-9, which also 24-8 for Cam Bobier was still a little quicker. So Tony Elias trying to get the job done and reel in these riders as here's another look at the move. Yeah, Tony just did one of his jobs where he goes to the apex, gets the pass done, but it puts him a little wide, so it's going to make it to where Josh can try to go back up underneath him. But at this point, you can even see on the screen right now, 25 flat that time by. And, you know, it's, it's so early in the race, and it's not like, you know, I don't feel like Tony did anything there to chop up Josh or do anything to distract him. It is still a race, and Tony's trying to go chase these two guys, and you can see the gap that he's pulled, and now Josh Heron is in the crosshairs of J.D. Beach as well. So the thing is, is that there was nothing that Tony did there in that instance to me, Greg. So here's Josh Heron. He's going to be coming under fire from J.D. Beach. Can J.D. Beach get by Josh Heron and set sail for a possible podium finish? That's what we're getting ready to find out. Onto the front straightaway they come, and JD with his JD foot off gets, the peg. Yep, just off the peg there. Let's see if th this attack Yamaha has as he's trying to get up alongside Josh Heron as they go down into the turn one area. Let's see what JD does. He's laid on the brakes and going to the inside. It looks like he's going to make the pass on Heron as they head down into turn one, and he does. Makes it really clean as well, and he's still got those lead three guys. Now, in his win last week at that 
in, in Arizona, he was three, four seconds behind the leader for the majority of that race and just kept chipping away. Good point. Chipping away, chipping away, chipping away. And that's what he's trying to do right now. Those leaders have not got out of his range at all. So now it's just a, a matter of can JD, you know, obviously trying his best to keep the tires underneath them, but the pace at the front of those three guys is what it is. And, and JD's kind of going with them right now. And JD has three factory bikes in front of him, Jason. And consensus around the paddock is, is that factory to privateer, where it really makes the big difference is at that halfway point forward. Yeah. You know, as we, we look at that attack, Performance, Estenson Racing, Yamaha. That's a privateer effort put together by Richard Stamboli. And so, can they start to close the gap between those factory riders there at that halfway point? So, Beach has got to get onto the back of Tony Elias if he's going to do anything late in this race because he's just got to sit there and just watch that pace and yep. get on it. So, he's got to close that gap. But Bobier continues to just click these laps off. He's That's in right. no rush to get away from his teammate. Right now, that gap is three-tenths. It might even go a little bit larger here. As they come across the strike, we can see it's just about four-tenths of a second. So Bobier seems content at the moment. Top speed through the trap, by the way, Garrett Gerloff, 181 miles per hour here on these superbikes. And I guarantee you, if you look at the data, they're up nearly 190 by the time they roll off the throttle and hit the brakes getting into turn one. That's right. And you can see what's kind of happening to me now. It looks like... Almost looks like the front four kind of getting a little bit closer together. J.D. Beach just did his personal best 24-7, which was two tenths quicker than what Cameron Bobier had done. And almost a full, almost a half a second quicker than the rider in front of him, Tony Ilias. So J.D. is just doing what he does. He's ch chucking in these laps and just trying to stay consistent the most he can and keep these guys in sight. Now, what we have seen with the 24 bike as we've seen him kind of just pace those leaders before as well, where we've thought in the past that he's, oh, Tony's not going to be able to go with him, and then he goes with him. And, you know, right now we're in that stage where, what are we, Greg, nine laps in of 23. We're not even close to halfway yet. Mm -hmm. So, and, and Cameron is just so good, like you said, at clicking off these laps. Yeah, we could kind of see a little foreshadowing of this race with Cameron Bobby and the time that he was able to do in Super Bowl qualifying on that race tire. Very comfortable. And when he comes to a racetrack, keep in mind too, Jason, that this is the last of the racetracks that we go to. Yep. That's the first time that the new big Dunlop tire has come to, meaning they introduced it at Road America last year. Got it. Yep. And we go back to Road America for the first time with this new big rear tire. So this is the first time that Cameron's had a shot at VIR with this new tire combination, which is not only the larger rear Dunlop introduced last year, but it's also that extra stop front that he's just fell in love with and created that push to win the national championship last year. Yeah, it's good when we got that view out the front of Cameron's bike there because you can actually listen to what he does. So right now the bike's going to be in second. As they come out of here, he's going to do third about right there, and then he's going to go up to fourth. He's going to go back to second for this next turn. You're going to see a couple downshifts. That's second gear. Now what the Yamaha, what the factory Yamahas do that are great is from here they run the gear where you can see his shifting is never going to. He's never going to shift here, Greg. Being able to keep your feet in those same positions all the way through these really quick transitions left to right is such an advantage. It's it's time when you have to upshift to third, back to second. They just keep it in the same gear all the way down. Now, they're probably, they might even go back to first. They didn't get to here to watch, as you can get a look at our Suzuki weather report there. 84 degrees, Greg, six mile an hour wind, almost perfect conditions. And now these guys head down the hill. But, but what it allows them to do by running that one gear across the top of the ridge is it allows them to keep the balls of their feet on the foot pegs, not have to make any transitions back and forth with an upshift and a downshift. Makes it a lot easier. And keep in mind with that weather, that Suzuki weather to 84 degrees, I believe this is the hottest we've raced so far the 2019 season as Tony Elias is going to throw a shot to Garrett Gerloff. So Elias is going to dive right for that apex. Can he hold it tight? So he does nice and tidy. He'll take over second spot. Can he set sail, though, after Cameron Bobier as Gerloff is having one of the more consistent races that we've seen Correct. You know, so it's far good, this season? It's a good season. run for Garrett, yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. Tony, I, I, I'm literally going to talk to him about this so I can tell our viewers more, but he has this ability to do what no other rider does. He was such a long way back. You see how far back he was when they got into their braking zone? Mm -hmm. And then he's able to just just get off the middle part of the tire enough but still trail brake a ton all the way to the apex. I talk about it all the time. 
but he has this ability to even be two or three bike lengths behind somebody and still make that pass and get the bike slowed down at the apex. Two distinct ways to ride a motorcycle, two distinct ways to talk about it. Someone who can go fast, which is important, or someone who's able to do this, yep. which is just pure racecraft and setting up a motorcycle to do it. It's experience. You can see he's on the brakes. He's three bike lengths behind. But then he just makes this run down there, and it's not like the bike is all backed in. It's not out of shape. And he gets the bike stopped. So it, it's it's pretty impressive to be able to watch him do that time after time. And it's such a surprising thing as a rider that's getting past to think of a guy going by you as quick as he does and still get the bike stopped at the apex of the corner. And talking with his crew, by the way, and we're talking about Tony Elias, not Cameron Bobier at the moment as he continues to lead the way. Though, let's see the gap as they come across. Nine tenths of a second. Oh, is Gerloff going to try him now? It's just look it's up just the inside. It's so hard to do it. But in talking with Tony Elias' yeah. crew about the way he rides, one of the things that's very interesting is I think that people have a perception that when Tony does the move that he just did, goes to the apex, that he aggressively snaps the throttle closed and aggressively grabs the brakes. He does not. <laughs> no I've way. seen the data traces. Yeah. It is a smooth roll. Roll off of the throttle and a smooth roll on of the brakes. And it's what the Suzuki really demands. It's it's a difference in what Suzuki thinks. The Suzuki crew thinks like the Yamaha is a little bit more forgiving. So the Suzuki demands a little bit more smooth throttle input and smooth brake input. And so it's really just a controlled motion and, and provides him so much feel on the front end of the motorcycle as well, which is what Tony needs in order to make those moves. Yeah, and you can't, what he does there, you couldn't do it drastically. You couldn't be grabby. You couldn't use up all the stroke of the bike right off the bat. He has this ability to be able to brake smooth, Greg, so it's good that you've seen that data, and it's kind of what I would expect. But right now, Cameron Bobby is just starting to get that little bit of window of sunshine there where he was a second when they came across the first uh, this last lap. He's opened up two tenths in the first sector, another two tenths in the sector, second sector, so he's now going to be a full second ahead when he comes across this lap. So when he comes through the next time, he's actually going to get that plus one or plus two. Where that's important, as a racer, when you're 0 0.6, 0 0.6, 0 0.6, as soon as you see it go to one second, it, it feels like it's a mile then. It feels like you're really starting to break that group. And 24.8 that time for Cameron Bovier, only a tenth off his quickest. Now, hmm. Josh Heron has now just got Jake Lewis for company. Jake Lewis that last time by runs a 26.2. So these guys are they're about a second off the guys just in front of them right now. But um, yeah, so. Jake Lewis on that M4X star Suzuki with his injury, his foot injury, told me that it's the best it's felt. Yeah, it's you know, good. It's it, it's, yeah, he's walking around. Oh, fibula, yeah, he's walking around better. He feels better, but still, for Jake, when he was injured, he didn't get to train at all. Yeah, no, and, that's hard. and so at Coda, when he got to those last few laps of the race, he decided like he was just tired. And and of course, it takes so. Look, these riders are so incredibly fit. Some of the most fit athletes in the world, without question. I mean, they're wrestling around, as you can see, Josh Heron, the number two bike, wrestling around a 370, 365 pound motorcycle, pushing well over 200 horsepower in full leathers, boots, gloves, helmets, in 84 degrees. It takes a lot out of you. No, it definitely and does. And you have and, to be and fit and to go. Too. Yeah. Oh, at that place, too. Because yeah, there's so Coda. much hard braking. <laughs> yeah. There's so much hard braking at Coda, so for sure. I could see how Jake could feel like that, but he's putting in a really good ride right now. And to be able to follow the Yoshimura Suzuki and kind of see what that bike's doing differently, looking at top speeds even as they come onto the front straightaway here. And Jake's a big, tall guy, so he's one of the most tall guys that we have. And let's just see if he can get anywhere near the draft. And this bike looks pretty fast down that front straightaway. I'm mm -hmm. just looking to see, Greg, what kind of speed did he go? Uh, 170, yeah, 174, 176. The foundation of the motorcycle, the same for these two bikes. The GSXR 1000, same bike that you can buy off the showroom floor, but the foundation of electronics, dramatically different. Yeah. As the M4X Star Suzuki is based off of a Motec system, a homologated system, kind of late in the season for this team. So they started from ground zero, where the Yoshimura Suzuki of Josh Heron has that Magneti Morelli system. Fastest lap of the race recorded, by the way, by Cameron Bobier as Cameron continues to eke away a lead. 1.7 now over Leas, a 24-5 by Bobier out front <laughs> on lap 13. Yeah, and Josh will be able to, to, like today you can see, he's probably got a couple little struggles. He'll be able to go back to his crew, and he's really good about rebounding the second day and, and trying to be more, uh, more up front where, where these guys are going to be. He struggled a little bit this morning, first time here on that Yosh bike like you had discussed. So let's look down. Here we go again. Tony now just ever so slightly. It looks like he was trying to get away from Garrett. This is going down into turn one earlier. And this is both, yeah, this is Cameron going up for the lead. and Cameron Bobia going for the lead. And Tony Elias going by J.D. Beach. Then Tony goes underneath Josh Heron as they went into turn four. 
flipped it back over to, into turn five. And then Tony made a big lunge about five laps, four laps ago, up underneath Garrett Gerloff into turn one. And that's kind of where we sit now. 24-7 the last time through for Cameron Bobier. The next two guys are 25-4 and 25-3. And these are those other two guys, Tony Elias and, and uh, Garrett Gerloff running second and third right now. They've got a bit of a gap now. As you can see, J.D. Beach is still back there. He's trying to get himself up into fourth. And it looks great like Josh Heron is pitted. Uh, on our oh. screen right now, he's actually, so he was obviously having some sort of little issue. Not sure what that was. Now, so it looks like, so it's going to be Bobier, Elias, Gerloff, J.D. Beach, as you can see. So Jake Lewis in fifth spot. Jake Gagne, yeah, there's Heron. There's Heron rolling yes. into the pits. So he's obviously, the bike has died or it's done something strange there, so. Yeah, total speculation that there might be something else going on as his crew is going to park that thing. So unfortunately for Heron fans, he's out of this one, but he'll be back tomorrow. As I was mentioning, back in sixth place is Jake Gagne. That moves him up. Cam Peterson to seventh. David Anthony to eighth. Kyle Wyman fans, he's up to ninth spot. Then Flinders and Samuel Trepanier from Canada. Yeah, we've had a little bit of attrition in this race for sure. Yeah, Matthew Skoltz out now, Josh Heron out as well. San Rico still out there circulating in 13th spot. This is the battle for second place. Tony Elias. As Gerloff just continues to hound him. Let's take a look at what happened here. It's gonna be Garrett jumping curbs. I was over watching him do this this morning. And you can see he uses a little bit more of that curbing and he's up for a wild ride there. And, <laughs> and uh, that, that won't affect him. I watched him do it this morning, Greg, where he was jumping that curbing more of an angle. You can see just behind J.D. Beach is a little bit inside that spot. Oh, he finishes but, uh, it with a little wheelie yeah, Wednesday. Garrett, you see Garrett there again, but he just makes it work for him. And sometimes it gets a little loose, that's all. And got to ride the wiggle. <laughs> Funny guy. Ride the wiggle. All right, so Garrett Gerloff with a bit between his teeth as he continues to hound the back of Tony Elias's bike. As for J.D. Beach, he's settled into his rhythm. He can see him just there, just about two seconds ahead of him, but it doesn't look like Beach has anything that he can do about it at the moment. But again, his first year on the Attack Performance Esteson Race and Superbike, so another huge data gathering. They can go back and take a look at that and improvements for tomorrow. We're on an abbreviated schedule, meaning it's a two-day schedule here. We have one of four for the season. VIR the first. So the first experience these teams get at a two-day event. So no practice and qualifying on Friday, then rolling into the race day. Everything happened today. So it's a bit more of a hectic schedule and teams having to figure out how they're going to manage their resources to get these motorcycles up to speed as quickly as possible. So Jason, you and I have talked about it off camera plenty of times. We expect to see a big performance jump from a lot of classes, a lot of riders heading into tomorrow as they get to look at what happened today. No question. Make changes and get a good night's sleep. Yeah, absolutely. And we kind of got to wonder where we saw Tony's bike kind of falter a little bit this morning in qualifying. I'm wondering if Josh has kind of got that same problem now. I'm not sure what that could possibly be. But one would think that with the two Yosh bikes, both of them having small problems today, um, you know, maybe it's maybe it might be the same issue. This guy right now has got zero issues. 25-1 last lap by. He's got three three and a half second lead, Greg. He's just kind of on cruise control. And here we go. This is going to be Cameron. This is where he tipped off a little bit earlier this morning. This is the turn four area and the transition back to turn five. Now, at this point earlier, you can see how the front gets a little bit light there, but this morning it got really light while he was under the under, accelerate, under acceleration, and when he flipped back to the right, it was just enough to push that front tire out from underneath him. Right there, though, it looks as smooth as, doesn't it? Yeah, Cameron Bo Bobier always looks like he's riding with such little effort, doing a great job. And you can see, look at his left foot. You see how he's got his heel into into the frame guard and his left foot's kind of pointed out. It's going to be a way for him to kind of keep himself on the bike, keep a little bit more connected with the motorcycle and just watching him and you can see it even from that spot as well. Six laps to go in this one. Can Cameron Bobier continue to lead the way in this one? We're going to find out. All right, Tony Elias, 25-1 the last time by. So he took four tenths of a second out of Cameron Bobier and started to pull away a little bit from Gerloff as Gerloff had kind of made that gap up. It's just a couple tenths here or there, but at this late stage of the race, with this five and, a, five and a half laps or so to go, it can make a huge difference. And this is the part of the race where Tony Elias seems to have a little bit of magic too. 
It's like, okay, I've got this guy on, you know, Cameron Bobier looks like he's gone in yeah. this one. Okay. I don't think Garrett's going anywhere, though. I, I don't think so, and I yeah. think Garrett's playing it for – he wants to make it a 1-2 podium finish for Yamaha. He definitely doesn't want the Suzuki spoiling the party. No, and there's J.D. Beach just running up a lonely fourth, you know, right this second. Um, still good lap times for him. He had gone 24-7 earlier, last lap 26-1. He's a little bit nowhere – no man's land, I guess you could say. You can see the guys up in front of him. And right now, as a rider, your main focus is, let's see how close I can keep this. All right, let's get down to Hannah. I think she's got an update from the pits. Yeah, I stuck my head in the Suzuki pit and talked to the team really quick. They're not sure specifically exactly what's wrong. Um, definitely something mechanical, I'm sure, with some troubleshooting later, though. They'll, they'll be able to figure out and get it sorted for tomorrow, hopefully. But a really unfortunate end to the race for Heron. All right, thanks a lot, Hannah, for that Cycle Gear track report. Oh, oh Garrett Gerlach. It's Gerlach. Mistake. Ah. That's going to be down in turn one. So now look at who it gives hope to. J.D. Beach is like, hmm. So Garrett Gerloff, look at all the dirt on the, yeah. on the right side of the tire. So I want Garrett to hopefully be a little bit careful when he tips it into this next right-hander because his tires are still pretty hot, Greg, but you're going to have a little bit of dust. So, yeah, he's going to get drawn in here a little bit, not quite get turned. And then you get to a point where you think, okay, I can't keep trying to tip it in, otherwise I'm going to fall over. And he does a good job. Excellent motocrosser is Garrett oh, yeah. Gerloff. Oh, yeah. I've seen a lot of videos yeah. of him on a motocross <laughs> bike. He's amazing. And so that's going to slide him just back into the clutches of JD a little bit. So he's got to get back to work to try to pull out some distance here with five to go, four and a half laps to go. But that's going to help secure things a little bit for Tony Elias in second spot. I think Garrett Gerloff still in 2019 looking for that flawless race. I mean, he had a good one first race in Texas where he was able to finish third, but he's had some drama over the course yeah. of the season. Yeah, there's no question. It's just it seems that uh, when we come race time, there's just a little something missing in Garrett's program, and, and literally that's all it is. His crew have done a tremendous job putting a great bike underneath him. I believe it's Mike Canfield is his crew chief down there, so Mike's done a good job uh, to make him comfortable on that motorcycle. So now it's just a matter of, here you go, you get a good look out. Now let's see if we can listen to this bike a little bit. Here, Greg, one mm -hmm. gear. So yep. basically, he goes back to second gear for turn one, and then he just runs the second gear all through here. So his 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 effort output, as far as having to do a lot with the bike, is so minuscule. He'll click third, then he'll click fourth down the straightaway, then he goes back to second, and he basically holds that all the way till the time he comes onto the front straightaway. So it makes it very effortless and very easy way to ride a motorcycle. And it's an easy way to do that on a 1,000 cc superbike. Can't really do that on a 400 cc yep. motorcycle no, because of yep. what the characteristics of the motorcycle have. Uh, the biggest point of a superbike is definitely acceleration. I mean, they accelerate yes. great and a very broad power band. Yep, no Through doubt. lap traffic goes Cameron Bobier. And the other thing that you think about too is with the advancement of electronics, it used to be back in the day when we didn't have electronics on the bikes. Maladin used to ride the bikes very similar to this. Uh, we went to some places where I would ask him what his like, gear patterns were, and I was astounded by it. I was shocked. But when you hear what Cameron's doing, so he's probably up to sixth on the front, maybe even fifth. I'm not sure if he's running you know, three, four speed, but what it allows him to do is limit the amount of upshifts and downshifts. I see so many track riders at track days think that they got to use all six gears just to use them. But the ultimate reason of why you shift is because normally you have to shift. But on a 1,000, what you can do is you can rely on the electronics a little bit. Here's a good battle we got going back a little further. Jake Gagne and David Anthony, and they're making their way through some traffic as well. Mm -hmm. So Gagne on the 32, and of course, last time we saw him, he was out. You know, he's coming back from Coda. a tip fib break at Coda. He, he crashed and he was hurting, and we were really questioning whether the 32 on the Shy B Racing BMW was able to do it. Gagne, of course, we know is a great talent in this class. And I just David Anthony, in, in the year that he's starting to put together, is absolutely fantastic. David Anthony, the Australian Aussie Dave on the 25 on that Fly Racing ADR Motorsports Kawasaki. So it's Kawasaki versus BMW at the moment. And he rides every weekend. I mean, David's out there chasing Cowie money. I see him at uh, Chuckwalla as well. I see, I see he went to Vegas. I see he goes out to AFM at Button Willow and so on. So he is out there every weekend putting it down. And I don't know if there's a guy in our paddock that works harder than him. As you can see, he's got a little bit of a run here on Gagne. He's going to try to do something with him maybe in turn seven. Let's have a look. Nope, no. Gagne is pretty late on the brakes there. And these, this is going to be the time for Gagne where, where his legs are going to start bothering him. You know, two, three, four laps to go. 
it's going through a lot. And believe it or not, the leg will probably feel better tomorrow than it does today. It's almost mm. like you're getting the thing a bit of a workout. You can see, I can tell Jake's not quite riding like exactly like himself from what I've seen in the past. Sure. So you can see it. See how yeah, up in the CD the, is right there? Not as much the mobility. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You could just kind of tell by watching him and how he's riding. So David Anthony can probably see that as well, and is just trying to figure out the spot he wants to get past him. The battle for sixth and seventh spot as Gagne's in sixth, Anthony. So it's BMW versus Kawasaki horsepower. Anthony in the draft, down the front straightaway, through the kink. Roll off the throttle into turn number one is Anthony Cohen going to try to give him that shot. Uh, not close enough. It, it even like the last the part of the, yeah, yeah, it looks like the last part of the tip in is hard for Jake. And it's not a bike thing. It's just, it's a physical thing. He's not, he's not getting around on the bike the way I normally see him getting around on the bike. And you can kind of tell. Coming off of a world superbike effort that didn't really pan out. Still on an aging Honda in World Superbike. Yeah. So many people excited to have Jake Gagne back here in the United States, but the excitement has been quelled by the injury that he suffered in a training incident on a motocross bike, and everyone holding their breath waiting for Jake Gagne to get back to 100% strength because there are so many people that believe, including his team owner, that Jake Gagne can be right in the mix up front with the rest of these factory bikes. Yeah, that's right. No, there's no question. It's in you know, the, the three three and a half weeks off and here we go final lap grade Cameron Bobier 26 flat last lap by 25 9 for Tony Elias right behind him some four seconds so this guy's just ridden flawless kind of kind of felt that after we said the Super Bowl you know I said Super Bowl when I saw him still finish in second on a race tire he never <laughs> got to put that cue on we thought that the lap record might go today if you could have got on that cue yeah I think so and uh, but it's been a fairly easy race I would say for Cameron yeah because his, his his lap record was a 23-7 Last year, he set that in Super Bowl qualifying, and he did a 24-1 on race rubber. And we know that that cue is definitely worth more than four-tenths of a second. Would have loved to have been able to see him on it, but that doesn't score you any points. And this ties him with Miguel? This will tie him with Miguel. Yeah, Miguel Blumel in all-time wins. Yeah, our it'll, earlier stat that you showed. It'll move Cameron Bobier to 34 wins on the all-time win record. He leads the way in active superbike racers in the EBC Superbike class. 31 of those are in Moto America in this EBC Brake Superbike class. What a show, what a talent. A lot of people questioning whether Cameron Bobier should stay here or go to Europe. He chose to be here on the factory Monster Energy Yamalube Yamaha factory racing machine. Onto the front straightaway he comes, and Cameron Bobier will take victory in race number one here at Virginia International Raceway. And he does it in commanding style. Three and a half seconds over this rider, 24, Tony Elias. His teammate, Garrett Gerloff, across the line. J.D. Beach also in the books. So what a ride by Cameron Bobier. And we're going to see what this does for the points because Tony Elias had 13 over Bobier coming in. So I'm no mathematician, but there's five difference between 25 and 20, Jason. So that's going to close the gap to eight. Yep. Yep, it's going to keep it close between those two guys. There's a great look at Jake Lewis coming home fifth. And here's that battle that we had for sixth and seventh. It's going to be Jake Gagne bringing it home over David Anthony. And then behind these guys, about 10 seconds back or so, Cam Peterson doing a really good job. He made it into Super Bowl today. And uh, Cameron's going to come across the line. Oh, and it looks yep, like... No, I think that was a back marker in front oh, of Oh, that was so back marker, yeah. Cameron so gets eight, Kyle Wyman I thought Wyman Kyle ninth. Wyman had closed that two-second gap. So yep. as we're, you're watching your race winner, we continue to watch the timing and scoring. So Cameron Bobier will take victory after an incredible start by Westby Racing's Matthew Skultz, who was leading by a couple of bike lengths and then had lost the front up in turn number 10. And that... Battle ensued between Bobier, Elias, Gerloff, J.D. Beach in the mix as well. Bobier didn't have it his way as we look at Kyle Wyman, who finishes in the top ten. So ninth place points for the Ducati rider, how Kyle great, Wyman. How great does that bike look? Looks good. I just want to see it to where Kyle can really get on it and race it. And, and you know. so much in the future. Jason, I'm going to tell you this right now with Kyle Wyman and his Ducati effort. The support from the Bologna factory, Ducati Corsa, is starting to trickle into Kyle's program. Yep. And he has the stock electronics on this bike, the same ones that you can buy out there, but they do already have the Magneti Morelli system that Ducati, you know, Kyle got it, he purchased it, but they're sending over 
an, a, a technician from Ducati Corsa, yep. and they're going to test at pit race next oh, week. So the bikes great. are going back to New York. So as the evolution of that Ducati V4R continues for Indy Motorsports Ranch KWR machine, we'll keep an eye on his progress. But this guy right here, Cameron Bobier, so dialed in at Virginia International Raceway. And when he first got on this Monster Energy Yamalube Yamaha factory team, the man at VIR was Josh Hayes. Yep. And Bobier took a lot of plays out of Hayes' playbook over the years here. And he just showed how he can dominate with a three and a half second victory. So you have Bobier Elias Gerloff, JD Beach in fourth, Jake Lewis in fifth spot. We saw Gagne and David Anthony as we take a look at our results so you can read along with me three and a half seconds and then garrett gerloff with the miscue in yeah. turn number one yep i would have said had he not made that mistake it would have been an absolute battle for second spot but 9.4 seconds then jd beach 13 nine back like i said tomorrow jason i just don't think we're going to see these large gaps no matthew skultz will be right there he'll he'll go back he'll sit with chuck they'll figure a couple things out hopefully and uh, or his crew and uh, you'll see Matthew up there tomorrow. It's too bad he couldn't just get his bike working to where he could have got some points. Also, Josh Heron, we'll see him up there tomorrow too because he'll he'll do the same with his crew. They'll make some changes to that bike. Uh, whatever problems that Josh was having, electrical, hopefully the bike will run, but it also looked like he was talking to the Olin's Tech a little bit about some things that the front of the motorcycle was doing. So Bobier logs his 34th. EBC Brakes Superbike win. We'll take a break. When we come back, we'll get to hear from Cam about his race. Today's coverage has been brought to you by Dunlop, the official tire of the 2019 Moto America Championship. Back at Virginia International Raceway with the EBC Brakes Superbike class all wrapped up. Let's get right down to Hannah. I've got Garrett Gerloff, third place finish for you today. Still chasing that elusive win. Tell us a little bit about your battle with Tony. You seem a little disappointed right now. Yeah, I mean, I'm disappointed. It sucks that I just made that mistake going in turn one, but I, I was really struggling into one and uh, seven and also back where Schultz crashed. It was just uh, a little greasy the other day um, and just kind of had just trouble keep, keeping momentum going in those sections. And uh, so I was trying to make it up in other areas and and Tony and, and Cameron was riding awesome, uh, just walking away out, out front. Uh, I really want to be there with him at the end and uh, be fighting for that win. But uh, we definitely got some good data, and I got some, some things uh, that I'd like to improve for tomorrow. So, uh, yeah, feeling good. But uh, big thanks to my whole uh, Monster Energy, Yamaha Financial Services, Yamalu Graves, uh, Yamaha team, and all the guys working, working their butts off to give me the best bike possible. possible. Uh, thanks to HAC Helmets. Cortec uh, suits and CD boots and everybody. Uh, sorry, it's a little hot out here. <laughs> but thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Thanks, Garrett. Yeah, it is definitely hot. I mean, like I said, it's it's the hottest one of the race. You know, in a couple of months from now, Jason, obviously, 84 is going to be a dream. Yeah, you're in, you're not kidding. Yeah. Summer sport, you yeah. know, but but riders have to get used to this heat, definitely. So it's their first taste. It's something a little toasty. And like Garrett was talking about, a little greasy. What does a little greasy mean, A little Jason? greasy means that you're feeling the bikes moving a lot underneath you, and, and that could have been kind of what the fate for Matthew was up there at Matthew Schultz in turn 10. Let's on, head on back down to Hannah with Tony Elias. Tony, fighting your way from ninth on the grid, having some electronic issues earlier this morning or whatever was going on. Are you happy with this result right now? Yeah, I'm so, so happy. Uh, first of all, thanks to my team. They did an amazing job. We swiped the bikes. Uh, uh, we had the problem this morning, so we swiped the bikes, and they solved the problem for the race. I tried to 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 make a good start. I did it. I've been too calm in the first two, three corners, so what I gain, I lose in the second or third corner. But after that, I could overtake some riders. I could um, found my rhythm. But when I arrived in the second position, uh, was not enough. Cameron today had that extra plus, uh, that extra faster rhythm, so it's okay. Congratulations to him. We, we save a very important points after everything. And uh, tomorrow is another one. I will think a lot uh, how to improve the bike with my team and we'll try to, to win. Thanks, Tony. We'll see you tomorrow. 
I think the hardest part for Tony is just the starting starting position. Something about VIR coming from the third row all the time, and uh, mm -hmm. you know, starting starting from there. And now everybody has launch control, so the starts you don't see that jackrabbit start as much as maybe we used to, and uh, so it makes it a little easier for everybody to get off the grid. So you got to do a lot of your hard work in those first three or four corners. And you heard him say he could have been a little bit more aggressive, but then you run the risk of. of causing some bigger issues and losing points and that kind of thing. Yeah, it'll be a long, long night of homework for all the crew, except for maybe this guy's crew, Hannah. Cam, led by such a gap there, what was it that made you feel so confident and strong enough to really pull away and, and lead for the duration of that race? I think multiple things. Uh, my Yamaha guys have been working so hard. Um, as so I really like this track. I feel like the R1 suits it really well. Um, my R1 likes to be on the side of the tire, and I feel like that's where we make up some time on the guys. So, uh, yeah, it was uh, it was a bummer to crash this morning in Super Bowl. Um, put those guys to work rebuilding the bike before before the race. But uh, that one's definitely for them after uh, after crashing a bike up this morning. So uh, I felt I was really happy just, uh, you know, just with my fitness. And uh, I mean, it's pretty hot out here today. And I knew Tony and Garrett were going to be really tough today. So uh, to pull a little gap that, uh, that gave me a little confidence. So um, congrats to them too. I'm sure it's going to be even tougher tomorrow. And uh, yeah, big hats off to my Monster Energy Yamaha, Yamalube Yamaha team, Bell, Alpine Sars, and Man Above for keeping me safe. And uh, yeah, all the fans for coming out. Congrats, Cam. Thank you so much. Best way, best way to reward your team after you have them rebuild your motorcycle. And I know he's done that a couple times in the past, but it doesn't phase him. He's such a smart guy, and he's able to be able to kind of access what, figure out what he has done. And you can see here, he just gets up underneath Garrett Gerloff very early in the race, gets the bike really slowed down, gave Garrett a lot of room there too. And um, yeah, I was able to go on and win this race pretty easily actually today for, for Cameron Bobier. So congratulations go out to the California native Cameron Bobier, the 3.5 second margin of victory. He'll take a look at that tonight, but he's got to do it all over again tomorrow. We'll take a break. When we come back, more from VIR.